Penny Haynes' new world record. She's got it. She's won it. It's gold for South Africa. She is South Africa's first gold medalist in any sport in 44 years. And Haynes becomes the first woman to win the 100 and 200 at an Olympic Games. after a dream? What causes us to do what so many are not willing to do? I suppose in the beginning days when I used to first do these talks after I had finished up with my swimming career, one of the questions that people would ask is why did you swim? And um, sometimes I would get the answer because you had a dream, you thought you'd go to the Olympic Games, you thought you'd win Olympic gold medals and you'd break world records. Sometimes people might even dare to say because you love the sport. Well, the truth is, sometimes I loved it, but a lot of the times I didn't. You see, I grew up in a time when South Africa, as you may recall, was in isolation. So we were not allowed to compete at the Olympic Games. And therefore, I did not grow up with the Olympic dream. I had no aspirations to go, and I never thought that I'd hold world records. So the reason why I swam goes much deeper than that. And may I just start off by saying that I believe whatever it is we do in life, you need to do it for the right reasons. You need to know why it is that you're pursuing whatever it is that you're doing. So it needs to be a reason deep enough to keep you going through the difficult times. Because as we all know, the journey to success is unfortunately not like this. We wish it was, right? But it's like this. And it's in these moments of disappointment and failure, that's where we've got to keep on keeping on. Because in those moments, we cannot see a better tomorrow. We cannot see what our potential may be. And if we don't have something deep enough driving us, we're going to give up prematurely. So why did I swim? Because after all, up and down a black line, that's not a lot of fun if there's any swimmers in the room. And so it goes much deeper, as I said. I was around the age of seven. I grew up along the coast just south of Durban. And as such, you learn to, gr you learn to swim from a very young age. And so I remember I was swimming next door in the neighbor's pool and I was racing their son and I happened to beat him. He was two years older than me. And so the mother came over to my mom and said, your daughter has talent, you should let her swim. And so off we went off to the school team and I challenged and eventually I was in the team. But around the same time, I grew up in a Christian home, so I attended Sunday school and I heard this story that always stuck with me. And you might be familiar with it, but it goes like this, that the master says to his three servants, I give you some talent. Now in the story, talent denotes rands, dollars, a monetary symbol. But to me, the word stuck. And the master gives the one guy five talents, the next two talents, and the third he gives one talent. Then he says, go and develop these talents. Multiply the talents. And he goes away for some time. The guy with the five talents, he multiplies it and he gets ten. The guy with the two multiplies to four. But the guy with the one talent, for whatever reason, maybe he was lazy, maybe he was afraid, but he buries the talent and he does nothing with it. After some time, the master comes back and he says, well done to the guy with the ten, well done to the guy with the four. But the guy with the one talent, he reprimands him and he says, you wicked servant, why did you not use the talent I gave you? And I remember going home that evening thinking about this and remembering that this lady said I had talent. And then it's almost like this holy fear came upon me where I thought to myself, someday I might stand before my maker and he may ask me what you do with the talent I gave you. And I wanted to be able to say, I did the absolute best I could with the talent that I was given. And this was the golden thread, thanks, throughout my swimming career. It's the single thought that kept me going through the difficult times. And there were several times. You'll notice I don't talk much about the Olympic Games because as much as it was nice and it was an honor for me to win, I didn't learn my greatest lessons on the podium. I learned my greatest lesson in the valley of failure. And that's what I want to touch on. So I started swimming for a club level from about the age of 12 and steadily I improved and South Africa for 32 years had not been to the Olympics and then suddenly this rumor started circulating that we would go to the Barcelona Olympic Games. 
This was my final year in high school and I was a little bit more focused on the academic side, but nonetheless, being the defending champion from the previous year's nationals, I went off to nationals. Long story short, I come second in the 100, but I had the fastest time from the morning. And in the 200, I kind of thought I'd cruise into the final and I cruised so much I missed the final. But I did have the fastest time in the B final. And so I certainly didn't think I'd go to the Olympic Games, so much so that I was making my way out to the car park when they called me back and said, you're in the team. As it turned out, I was the baby of the entire South African Olympic team. Now, those years we were really green and we weren't really ready for what, was, what international competition entailed. But nonetheless, we were told, go off to the various hospitals for dope testing. So there I am, I go off to the hospital, the nurse gives me a little cup for a urine sample, I start making my way back to the bathroom, and she says, no, 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 hang on, and I say, why? And she says, no, you've got to come back. I say, why? And she says, no, because I've got to go with you. So I say, why? She says, because I've got to watch. And I said, what kind of a pervert are you? <laughs> and that was my introduction into international sport. And this left me with a sense of, if this is what people are willing to do, for this perceived success, meaning gold, silver, bronze. They're willing to do anything, so much so they would not only dope, but they would in fact, as I understood it, you'd have some male athletes try and sneak in to be female athletes, and that's why they did gender verification tests at the Barcelona Olympic Games. Not too freaky guys, they check XY chromosome cells, and they, they check <laughs> to see if you're a female, and then you get this laminated little card that says you're a female, much like a driver's license. In Barcelona, because my mindset was so negative, and there's a lot of neuroscience behind negative mindsets, I'm sure Andre from Mueller this morning probably shared some of that with you, but because my mindset was so negative, I didn't perform too well, and I came 33rd and 34th, which is very close to last place. Had someone told me in Barcelona you'd go to the next Olympic Games, I would have thought they're crazy, much less that I would go to the Games and swim a final, and never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined a double goal. Once again, in Barcelona, I'm in this position, and I cannot imagine a better tomorrow. The problem is, I believe in life, we have a destiny, we have a potential that we are supposed to fulfill, and part of one of the, the um, clues to what that may be is this toolbox, let's call it, of various gifts that I believe we're given. The first is talent. The second I believe we're given is opportunity. And what we do with the opportunities that come our way is very, very important. Often, though, those opportunities present themselves at times when we don't feel like it. And one of these opportunities was for me to go to the University of Lincoln, Nebraska on a swimming scholarship. I don't know if you know where that is. Center of the United States, snow is this deep, minus 20 Celsius, sometimes might be minus 40 with a wind chill factor, to do the very thing I hate, swimming. But I go because in my heart of hearts I realize that if I don't, I will forever wonder what if. I go off to Nebraska when I get there, it's a long story and, and qu quite a colorful story, but time won't allow for it, but I get there and they shove me in a room with an American whose focus is the nightlife. She goes to bed at midnight, wakes up at midday, I go to bed at 8 p.m. at night, wake up at 5 a.m. to walk through the snow, to make my way to the swimming pool, to swim for six kilometers, and I did this nine times a week on top of a dry land. At first I hated it. I would swim up and down that black line, crying in my goggles, hating every moment of it. Until eventually I realized the problem I had was that my mind was on everything out there that I had no control over. And I believe the key to success in life is that you control the controllables. You do that which you can do and you do it to the absolute best of your ability. And in so doing, you can be excellent in the details. And that is what success is, merely the reflection of excellence in the details. And so every single day I would go to training and I began this habit where every single workout, every single breaststroke set, every single length, I would count every single stroke. And as I counted my strokes, I would focus on the details. Am I squeezing my feet together? Is my head in the right position, etc. And so this meant that eventually I improved because now I'm focusing on that which I can control and South Africa goes off to the Commonwealth Games where I come away with a bronze medal. From there we go off to Rome to the World Championships. Now we're there for a week prior to the competition, so we have this hotel with our own 50 meter pool and we would train there and then the Aussies and 
the Chinese who did not have their own pool, they would come and train there and I would sit on the balcony and I would spy on the enemy. <laughs> and I noticed that they were doing things I'd never done before and because, you know, at that age, at the age of 19, you know everything and so I had a lot to say about what I saw them doing. A few days later, the 100 breaststroke. And I'm in the fifth out of six heats in the morning. And that morning I go out behind the blocks, I take my marks, I dive in, I streamline, 1001, 1002, pull, 1001, 1002, break out. And as I'm breaking out, I start counting. One, two, three, and it's 24 strokes down. I turn 27 strokes back, I touch. I touch in first place in my heat in a new South African record and I just dip under the 110. So I'm extra exceedingly happy. I hop out the pool. I walk down the length of this 50 meter pool. And as I do, I'm watching the final heat swim. And there's Samantha Riley, this Australian girl, who was probably the closest thing I had to a hero. And she was way in front of everyone. And she goes there and back and touches in first place in a time that is a whole second, almost two seconds faster than the time I just swam. And I continue walking, and after they put up the results of that heat, moments later they put up the names of the 10 girls who would swim in the final that evening. In our ranking, first Samantha Riley, second Penny Haynes. I couldn't believe it. I'm going into my first World Championship final in second place. Very, very excited. So I make my way up to the stands. My coach at the time was on honeymoon, so I was there on my own essentially, but I sit down with the South African coaches, and they say to me, well done, etc. And I say to them, now, tonight, how can I improve? You see, we need to analyze what we do. And then we can see how we can improve. And instead of telling me what I needed to know, they said to me, Penny, you're going to win tonight. And I thought, this is shock. Now, please let me just say, it's so important that we surround ourselves with the right people. The people who will tell us what we need to know in order to become the best version of ourselves that we can be. And that's not always what we want to hear, right? And so they meant well, but I leave it and I go back to the hotel, I phone my coach and I tell him about the swim and he says, that's very, very exciting. And then he says to me now, tonight, what is your goal and what's your plan? And I could tell you about the study, about goal setting and planning, but just the long and short of it is that the, of an entire class, only 3% of law, graduating law students from Harvard had a goal and plan written down. When they reassessed this group, the 3% with goal and plan written down were wealthier in their individual capacities than the sum total 97% who did not have a goal and a plan. So there's great power in a goal and a plan, but make sure you write it down. A goal not written down is just a wish. And so he says to me tonight, what is your goal, what's your plan? And I say to him, well, the coaches seem to think I'm gonna win. And he says to me, no, you won't win. <laughs> but you see, your goals must be realistic but challenging. And the thing is, he wasn't trying to hurt me, he was being honest. The thing is, Sam Riley was two seconds faster than me. A realistic goal, though, is maybe to get a silver or bronze medal. And the plan is quite simply this, swim your own race. Do that which you can do to the best of your ability. And that's what we should do in life as well. How often are we running slash swimming somebody else's race, trying to live up to the Joneses or be what someone else is expecting us to be? So that night I go back to the pool, I line up in the blocks. This time I'm very much aware of the fact that Sam Riley, my hero, is next to me. I take my marks, I dive in, 1001, 1002, pull, 1001, 1002, breakout. And as I'm breaking out, I don't mean to, but out the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of Sam and I see her shoot ahead. And as I see Sam shoot ahead, I tense up and I panic and I take the next stroke and the next and the next. Long story short, Sam gets to the end, she touches in a new world record time of 107.69. Eventually, I make my way to the wall and I touch in sixth place in a time that is a whole second and a half slower than my time from the morning. The girl ends up with a bronze medal in half a second slower than I was in the morning. Of course, I'm heartbroken. All I want to do is I, I want to cry, but my parents are sitting up in the stands and we were taught, you never cry after a race, you always shake the winner's hand. So I hopped out and I shook Sam's hand. She had no clue who I was. Mm -hmm. And then I made my way up to the stands. And as I'm walking, I'm thinking to myself, okay, retire at the top, sixth place finish at the Worlds. That sounds like the top to me. It's a good idea to go home, get on with my studies. Surely my parents would be happy because now I'm trying to console myself, right? I'm in one of these moments. Now, if you're wondering, did my parents push me? I always say they never pushed me. They firmly encouraged me. <laughs> and it was something like this. As I sat down between them, they said to me, okay, don't worry, next time better, etc." And I said, no, 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 I'm going to retire, you know, move back home, 
swam for so many years, etc. And they listened and they said, okay, we'll support you if you want to do that. And then my mom said, and you can forever wonder what if. <laughs> that was like a dagger. Then she said, oh, despite how you feel right now, so important, you can choose, and this is the third greatest, I think, one of the greatest gifts, but the third point. You can choose. We all have the power of choice. You can choose to look at this failure and learn from it. Because it's in the midst of your failures and your disappointments. Therein lies the nuggets of truth. The very things we need to learn that will catapult us onto tomorrow's successes. This was exactly two years before Atlanta Olympics. Had that not happened, had Rome's failure not happened, I'm 100% certain that the success of Atlanta would not have happened. I've learned a lot of lessons in my career, but time won't allow me to share it. But let me just quickly recap. Identify our talents. Make the most of our opportunities. And then make wise choices, not on the whim of an emotion, because had I gone on my emotions, I would have retired three definite times in my career. But each time I had to really go back and analyze where I was at, analyze why I was feeling the way I'm feeling, and then make a decision that despite how I feel, I would continue until I reach that point in my life where I can honestly say I've done the absolute best with the talent that I was given. Thanks so much and God bless.